Imagine going through the storms in your life, like losing possessions or a job or even a child, and your friends tell you that it was your sins that caused it. In our lesson today, we see that Job's friends are blaming his storms on his hidden sins. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, February 20th, 2022. The title of this lesson and voice commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School commentary is Bildad's Misunderstands God's Justice. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aimed to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Let's get into our lesson, starting with the moment of prayer. Father, we ask that you be with us as we go through your word, as we learn to be more like you and less like the world, Lord. Help us to understand that we're not to judge people, but to help them, to mourn with them, as well as rejoice with them. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we move into our lesson, our scripture will be coming from Job chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, and then verses 20 through 22. Now, the main thought of our lesson will be coming from Job chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, and it reads, Then Bildad the Shuite replied to Job, How long will you go on like this? You sound like a blistering wind. Now, the aim of our lesson is by the end of this lesson, we will understand Bildad's response to Job's suffering, discern carefully when others misinterpret God's ways, and grow and live faithfully in God's just ways. Now, as we do each week, we'll start with a little bit of background. We're now in lesson 13 of the second quarter in a unit that's titled Justice and Adversity. This week's lesson is coming out of the book of Job. The author of the book is unknown, but the book addressed the problem of theodicy. Theodicy means the vindication of God, and it answers questions of why a good God permits the manifestation of evil, thus resulting in the issue of the problem of evil. Why does God allow good stuff to happen to bad people and bad stuff to happen to good people? This is called theodicy. Now, the book of Job, it is, it, there's a wealthy man named Job residing in the uh, city that's called Uz. The Bible describes Job's financial statue as making him a noteworthy person in the region uh, of, of the South. Now, he had a large family, a wife, seven sons, three daughters. In his possession were large quantities of land and animals. You find this in Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Now, in all that he owned, his greatest asset, though, was his faith. Job was considered blameless and upright, consistently mindful to live in the righteousness of God. Job's faith was so impressive that he garnered the attention of God and also Satan. In the first chapter of Job, we read an account of God questioning Satan about his schemes. Satan confessed that he had been roaming the earth. So God asked him if he considered his servant, Job. The question set up Job for an intense season of suffering, one that breaks him physically, emotionally, even spiritually, but he never forsake his faith. He never forsake God. All this occurred as a test for Job, allowing God to show Satan Job's faith. Now, over the course of one day, Job was given four reports. Each of them, um, he had heard about his sheep and his servants. His ten children all had died due to thieving intruders as well as natural disasters. Job rips his clothes and shaved his head in sorrow and in honor to God. Yet he still praised God in his prayers. Satan arrives in heaven again and God allowed him another opportunity to test Job. This time, Job is distressed with a terrible skin sores here. He, he, his wife even urges him to denounce God and just give up and die. But Job protests and tries to endure his affliction. 
Now, his three companions, his three friends, if you want to call them, arrived to comfort him. And they sat there with Job in silence for seven days uh, out of reverence of him grieving. However, on the seventh day, Job began to talk. And he started a discussion with each of them. And these four men share um, Job's reflection on Job's trouble in a very poetic manner. And this is where our lesson picks up today in Job chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, which reads, Then Bildad the Shuite replied to Job, How long will you go on like this? You sound like a blistering wind. Now, Bildad, we find, is the descendant of Shua, the son of Abraham, and Keturah. We find this in Genesis 25, verses 1 and 2. These families lived in the desert of Arabia. Now, in speaking with Job, um, Bildad's intent was first to console him, but then it led us to all sorts of accusations that we'll get into today. But let's back up for a moment. This verse actually starts with, then. Then means that there's something that happened before Bildad began to make this statement. What happens, we find, in chapters 5 and 6, Job is actually responding to his other friend, um, Eliphaz, about Eliphaz was saying that, hey, Job, you know, you, you must have done something. God wouldn't do this uh, unless you actually done something. You done something wrong in this scenario. So Job responded what, saying that he doesn't know why God is doing this to him. He, he doesn't know what he's doing wrong. He served God. So he have no idea why. So we, when we get to verse 7 here, Bildad is saying, no, you did something. How long are you going to um, continue to say this? Your words don't mean anything at all because something had to happen in order for God to be doing this to you. So what he was doing, he was God in his affliction that he was going through as God was correcting him. And, but he was saying that oh, God will give you a happy end, but he need to correct you right now because of your sin. So we find that uh, Bildad's response here and what he's telling Job is saying, no, I'm not buying it. You did something uh, for God to actually do this to you. So as we move down to verses three and four, it says, does God twist justice? Does the Almighty twist what is right? Your children must have sinned against him, so their punishment is well deserved. Bildad's conf uh, confidence is in the justice of God, in the idea that Job could only receive such calamities from God's punishing him immediately for some sin that he might have done. He didn't know what sin, but he must have sinned in some way, according to Bildad. He even mentioned the, the death of Job's children as part of the wages of Job's sin. He wants to set Job straight on the, this point that he sinned and now he's getting an immediate punishment from God. See, Bildad said, felt that there was no exception to his theory here. So he wrongly assumed that people suffer only as a result of their wicked ways or as a result of their sin. Bildad is so insensitive and so uncompassionate here in saying that Job's children died because of Job's wickedness. Bildad had no right to say that. Why? Because we know God let us know in the beginning of the book of Job that his children were not destroyed for that reason, for any sin that Job might have committed, even though it, it clearly said that Job was an upright, righteous man. So here's the question. How often do we jump to a conclusion in a similar way and make judgment on other people because of theories which we consider to be fully proven? And, and, and forget, forget the fact that there are usually exceptions to just about every rule that we may not be aware of. But here, it's so intrinsic that we understand that God punished good people, bad people, and sometimes it's not even a punishment. We find in this case, it's not a punishment at all. It's actually a test when it comes to Job. Jesus said in Matthew 5.45, he said, In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he has given sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. In other words, good people can go through bad things. And bad people can go through or have good things and vice versa. God determines this. But we do know this. All things work together for the good of those who love God. So we may be going through some tough situations, but God didn't forget about us. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. And this is very important for us to understand when we're going through the storm. 
See, the Bible tells us that as Christians, we will face suffering and persecution. So it's important that we don't treat our fellow brothers and sisters of the faith like Bildad did here and blame them for their suffering. Instead, brothers and sisters, when we see our, our brothers and sisters in Christ suffering, we're to comfort them and love on them the way Christ loves us. See, we can learn from this example of Job and his friends here. When we are aware of our friends hurting, we can follow uh, the uh, a positive example that these men did not set. These men didn't give us a, a positive example. A positive example would, would be them mourning with him, spending time together with him. Our physical presence when our friend or loved one is hurting can be a great comfort. And we may not have to say even a word. Just being there with them can help them go through the storm they face. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, there's a chance that we may very well be the rainbow in someone else's storm, in, in the trials that they face. We may be that person that God sent to show up in their life to let them know that God still loved them. So as we move down to verses five through seven, it reads, but if you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, if you are pure and live with integrity, if you, he will surely rise up and restore your happy home. And though you are started with little, you will end with much. We find Bildad is now giving Job some, some hope. He's saying that if you humble yourself and you pray and seek God's face and turn from your wicked ways, we, we, he's saying God is faithful and just and will forgive him his sins. And guess what? Everything Bildad said is absolutely correct. The problem with this statement is Job is already considered righteous and faithful, yet he's still going through all the storms that he has to face. Bildad, would, like everyone else in this drama, is unable to see the drama, be, uh, the, the drama that's behind the scenes in the heavenly realm. Therefore, the only way he can interpret Job's situation was to apply the principle of cause and effect. And this, and in that, he's called telling Job, "You need to repent because the effect of your sins is causing God to punish you." So he suggests that Job must have done something wrong. He has some hidden sin that's causing God to judge them. Now think about that just for, for, for one second. Job is upright. Job is, is faithful. Uh, and, and God has, has said he's a humble servant. Yet he still go through the storm. We cannot forget, brothers and sisters, that when we're going through the storm, it doesn't mean that we're, we're sinning. It could mean that God is testing us. That we have to go through this so we can get to where God wants us to be. We find here that Bildad was wrong as, as he assumed that because Job was not currently in a prosperous or an abundant state, that it proved that Job was not, um, he, he wasn't pure, he wasn't upright. He, he wished that he could prove that Job was, was no way possible that he was an upright man. He had to do something because now he's in poverty. Now he's lost everything. He, he wanted to affirm that his prosperity will someday increase as his faithfulness increase. And brothers and sisters, that is absolutely wrong. That's the problem with prosperity preaching. It's better to be poor with God on your side than rich and be alone. Some there are some that will be poor. In fact, Jesus said the poor will always be among you. When he said, that's why the woman with the oil, um, that's why he said it's okay for her to do that in honor of them because he won't always be with them. But the poor will always be with us. And therefore, we need to help them. So Bildad's um, speech is, is an implication that is that Job is not pure, that he's not upright, and the material prosperity is a direct link to one's righteous behavior. And that is 100% wrong. See, too often we associate temporal prosperity with righteousness and favor with God. But the true favor of God is only found in his love, in our joy, and our peace and not our wealth. We can, this is why we can go through storms in our life and still have joy and still have peace because we still have God. 
our money and material things, it will stay right here when we leave this earth. But the love of God will go with us as we spend eternity with him. Now, as we move down to verses 8 through 10, it says, just as the previous generation, pay attention to the experiences of our ancestor. For we are born yet yesterday and know nothing. Our days on earth are as fleeting as a shadow. But those who come before us will teach you. They will teach you the wisdom of the old. Now, Bildad basically belittles the experiences of a lifetime, which he regards as too short to gain wisdom and understanding. It, it, it is tradition, he says, that brings us um, to all that has been discovered in the past that will build up our baggage of knowledge. However, Isaiah tells us that wisdom begins with the knowledge of God. So this is completely false because we have to be born to understand that uh, God, so therefore we get our wisdom once we come into God. So his theory here is completely wrong. He said here that the ancestors can teach, teach them all that they need to learn. He implies that because we are here on earth, one day here, the next day gone tomorrow, we can't know all that there is to know. And that's true. We won't know all there is to know until we go home to be with the Father. However, while we're here on earth, as we give our life to Christ, we expect it to act on the things that we know about Christ. Therefore, Christ gives us everything we need to walk out of our per walk our purpose and walk in the calling that he's given us. We don't need the ancestor for that. We have Christ and the Holy Spirit. Now, Bildad quoted the ancestors, but even in the biblical um, history, they could see that there is no easily co uh, easy correlation between righteousness and blessing. And this is important because he's saying they learn everything from the ancestors. However, that's a, that misquote because he's saying that, hey, the correlation between good and evil and things happening to um, good people that are good and bad people that are bad, it doesn't add up. How do we know? We can even begin um, at the time when God created Adam and Eve. Their sons, Cain and Abel. Abel was described as righteous, and what was his reward for being righteous? He was awarded for being murdered by his brother Cain. So just because we're um, justified by God and because we are um, upright and righteous, it doesn't mean things won't happen to us. What it does mean that if it does happen to us, we still have God and we will have an opportunity to spend all eternity with God. Bildad was what we would call a traditionalist. Traditionalism is valuing tradition or as an unwritten law, which is over and above. Therefore, it's actually against the word of God. See, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees who had held so many traditions which conflicted God's direct commands to them. For example, Jesus condemned the practice called Coburn in which a person would dedicate their goods to the temple, i.e., God's use. But then they did not help their own parents for the very reason, saying that their goods and their finances were Coburn and therefore unavailable. This, of course, was contrary to the fourth commandment to honor one's parents. So Jesus told the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7, verse 1, he says, you reject commandments of God that you may keep your traditions. We have to make sure that we're not so into traditions that we're forgetting about the laws of God, that we're forgetting about the spirituality that comes with being a Christian. See, when we, we can get in quite a bit of danger when it comes to traditionalism. One thing about traditionalism is it, uh, it breeds hypocrisy. When, when certain traditions become so familiar that the reason behind them are forgotten, then the actions become mechanical and is giving um, the impression of spirituality, but it's not. How, uh, hymns can be sung without heart. Prayers can be predictable and ritual routines can, can be so hypocritical because it's done out of rhetoric. It's just done because that's what we do. So though a person may impress others as spiritual because of the, the, uh, his or her practices, the outward doing does not reflect the inner motive or desire. And we know God looks on the inside, not on the outside. So a person can be far away from God while um, claiming to be godly and, and conforming to a tradition. And that, brothers and sisters, is the definition of hypocrisy. 
So we can't be so involved with traditions like we found Bildad here that he's all about this is what the ancestor says and, and so on and so forth, believing that only good things happen to good people and no bad at all. And the thing about it, that's not even what was happening to his own ancestors. The Israelites didn't do anything to go into slavery with Egypt, in, in, in Egypt. So what we find here, we need to, to be able to distinguish between tradition and spirituality i.e. communion, on, only to be done on the first Sunday. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, do this as often. That could be first, second, third Sunday, or every Sunday. Also, this the, the tradition, oh, you shouldn't dance. Well, David danced. David danced as he was bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. So these things are tradition. These are not spiritual things, when, and we have to know the difference. Note that even Moses referred to the ancestors when he was talking to the Israelites. However, he put his trust 100% in God and God alone. In other words, we can find that the things that our parents do and our grandparents do and other people do, it may be absolutely wrong. That's why the Bible is the source of truth. Now, in our final verses, verses 20 through 22, it says, but look. God would not reject a person of integrity, nor would he lend a hand to the wicked. He will once again fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame and the home of the wicked will be destroyed. See, Bildad's whole philosophy is expressed in his words right here. He's saying God would not cast away the blameless, nor would he uphill the, the evildoers. But if indeed Job in this situation, especially in the beginning, was blameless. Now, there will be joyful time ahead for him and just as milk will be done for his enemy. But right then at that time, Job was already blameless. So he's saying that if Job turned from his wicked ways, he will once again be in a joyful place for the laughter if he would just turn to God again. Well, Bildad's conclusion is faulted because bad things happen to good people, good and righteous people, as a matter of fact, just as good things happen to bad people. For we understand that um, God's blessing reign on the just and the unjust. Um, and this is important to know. We should not make the mistake in thinking that when people go through something, that they are bad and, and they, must be they must have some atonement that needs to happen. No, as friends and family, when they are going through, we need to do what Paul wrote in Romans 12, 15. He said, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. We're not here to judge people. Only God does that. We don't know their past. We don't know what they've been through. We don't know why they're going through what they're going through. But we do know and I don't care how righteous they are, they will face trials and tribulations in this life. Bildad and his friend's speeches are example of how people often view suffering from a human perspective and assume that suffering is always the result of something that was done wrong. But in the end, Bildad and his friends discovered that God had allowed Job to suffer as part of his own divine plan, and Job was not to the blame for his trials, the death of his children, all that he had lost. He was not to blame. Someone may need to hear this today. You were not to blame for the loss of your child, the loss of certain things that, that happened in your life. Some of these things are part of God's divine plan, but we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called by his purpose. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, we can gain wisdom from what Job's friends did wrong. We should not assume that troubles are a sign of God's judgment. Instead of, of, of telling hurting people uh, to admit they are wrong and to repent, uh, which we don't know the reason why they're suffering anyway, we should join together and encourage a friend or family member to endure faithfully, knowing God will see our pain and he, will, he has a purpose for it that we may not know now, but I'm sure there's witness, even listening to me today, that had to endure, some, endure something, and in the end, we find out why we had to endure it, because God was pushing us 
to the next level in our life. When we turn our focus to God, we can offer great encouragement and hope to those in need, helping them who suffer to see God is actually still at work. When we're willing to enter into the pain of the suffering friend or family member, we follow the example that Jesus gave us, who came to bear our pain and suffer in our place, to live the life that we're supposed to live and die the death that we supposed to die. So in helping others who are in need is our ultimate way of serving Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, till next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. Goodbye.